Welcome to the Cowboy and to the 51st Anniversary Western Heritage Awards. We are so excited to see all of our friends and our supporters here for this Pinnacle event. For more than 50 years, we've inducted worthy individuals into our Halls of Fame, and we've honored writers, actors, filmmakers, and musicians who have made lasting contributions to the American West. It's a tradition that we hold with great pride. Tonight's award recipients and inductees receive a beautiful bronze Wrangler Award sculpted by Oklahoma artist Harold Holden. Harold, can you please stand up and let us applaud your great artistry. You know, as always, all of those that are gathered here for these inductions and awards have a vital common interest, and that is preserving the values that are inherent in our Western way of life. They define who we are and what we represent, characteristics such as honesty and loyalty, courage and perseverance. As always, thank you for supporting the museum's mission to safeguard those values, those things that we all call the code of the West. In fact, this year marks the most sponsors that we have ever had for this event. Can I ask all of our sponsors to stand and let us applaud you tonight? Thanks for your support. And I would also like to ask all of our board members to stand to be recognized. These people come from around the country and spend three days of meetings, so they do their, their hard work. Thank you very, very much. Listen, we also want to thank the sponsors that are listed in the program and that will be shown on the big screens that are rolling here tonight. By the way, as I said just a moment ago, this year we had the most sponsors we've ever had, and we want to once again just say thanks to all of you for your support. It's our special night honor tonight to have Ernest Bornein and Wyatt McRae, who will co mc our program after dinner. Both gentlemen are true devotees of the Western genre. They have bona fide credentials. Ernie Borgnine is an Academy Award-winning actor, and in his 60-year career, he's amassed more than 200 movies to his credit, including 32 Westerns. He is our 1996 inductee into the Hall of Great Western Performers, and certainly a great friend to this museum. Wyatt McRae is also a devoted Westerner, comes from a third-generation ranching family, and is the grandson of one of the most authentic Western actors in Western Hollywood history. Joel McRae, an inductee into our Hall of Great Western Performers in 1969. Wyatt Lecur currently serves on our Board of Directors. Let's thank both Wyatt and Ernie for being a part of these awards. Well, folks, right now it's my privilege to welcome to our stage a great friend of this museum, and for those of you that attend things like Chuck Wagon Festival and some of our other events that are, are so family friendly, you'll recognize our friend Wayne Cantwell. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please stand and remove cover as we ask Wayne to perform our national anthem.
and gentlemen, please welcome our MCs for this evening, Ernest Borgnine and Wyatt McRae. Pretty good tonight, Ernie. How about you? Hey, not bad, not bad. Go ahead, tell me more. Well, you know, I got promoted from presenter to co MC. I got a new hat. I just had a shot of Dr. Pepper backstage, so I'm doing pretty good. Man, I tell you, can't turn them loose for a minute. <laughs> you know, the 51st Western Heritage Awards. Doggone it, now we got it made. You know, that makes me the same age as this award show. <laughs> How old does that make you, Ernie? Well, really, it's none of your business, but I'm looking for that son of a gun uh, who started all that golden age business. <laughs> they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they, they know what you're talking about. Before we get started, Mr. Borgnine, I want to tell you, it is a real privilege for me to be on this stage with you here tonight. Oh, please. No. Uh, we, are, we are so happy that you agreed to be a, a co-MC tonight, and we have a few things we'd like to say to you. For all the years of wonder, wonderful entertainment you've given us, for all the sacrifice and dedication that you've shown this wonderful institution, on behalf of the board of directors, all the staff, museum staff, and all the people in this room tonight, I'm going to ask all you ladies and gentlemen to help me in giving a big thank you to this most extraordinary gentleman. are off to you, Ernie. <laughs> hey, we better get to work. All right, let's go. I'm so pleased to be here this evening following in the footsteps of my grandfather, Joel McRae, who proudly hosted this Western Heritage Awards several times during his lifetime, including a couple with the great Walter Brennan. Hey, you know, Wyatt, I once sat next to your grandparents at one of the awards, Academy Awards, as a matter of fact. B big deal, but I was there. <laughs> You remember who won that year? No, I don't, but I remember Joel McRae. <laughs> All right, it's now time to introduce our first presenter for the evening. Inducted into the Hall of Great Westerners in 2003, an eight-time Wrangler winner, please welcome Mr. Red Stiegel to present the Chester A. Reynolds Memorial Award, sponsored tonight by Barbara and Roger Simmons. Museum founder Chester A. Reynolds was a successful American businessman who believed strongly in preserving the Western way of life. His contribution is memorialized each year with an award named in his honor. It is bestowed on an individual or group demonstrating an unwavering commitment to Western ideals and values through a single remarkable achievement of work or a body of work. The man we are honoring was a simple cowboy who became an artist an artist who became a master, and through it all remained a humble family man who never strayed from his roots. And he is a man I am proud to have called my friend, legendary spur maker, Jerry Cates. Ask anyone who knew Jerry Cates to tell you about the spurs he made and they'll tell you first about what kind of man he was. Eventually, they'll get to talking about the quality of his work, which boils down to the fact that he was a cowboy who made spurs for cowboys. Jerry's extraordinary craftsmanship speaks for itself and is as dependable as the man who made it. All right, Jerry Cates, look, 15, 17, 17, All of which explains why Jerry Cates' work is a prized commodity at auctions like this one throughout the West. Five, 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 22. This is a great piece right there. Now, a true gentleman. He was very humble about his superior, really superior ability to create something that is usable, but is pretty to look at. He just had an easiness, a calm about him, just a very pleasantness about him. But he was uh, diligent at what he did and is artistic at what is his craft. 
he was his worst critic. And if he didn't like it, he would be thrown out there in the junk pile and you never saw it again. And he would start over. So anything that he sent out, he liked. And I think that's uh, the most thing about him, that he was nearly a perfectionist. Jerry Cates was thoroughly Texan. He grew up the son of a farmer whose days depended on the rising and setting of the sun. Maybe it was having to help provide for his little brothers at the ripe old age of 13, or the tough job of breaking horses on the family farm, or maybe the marathon days at LX Ranch in Amarillo that begin on horseback at 3 a.m. But Jerry's character was shaped by the Western way of life. He knew to build fence, how to build a cistern, you know, and who knows how to build a water cistern now, you know. But he could do things like that. He was used to doing any fencing, riding, milking cows. Uh, he just wanted to continue the cowboy life, and that's what he knew at the time, besides the army. The kind of man he was and the way he lived his life, he just wouldn't tell you a lie at all. If he told you he would do something, he would do it. I've known him a long time. He, and sure enough, before that, he was a cowboy, a sure enough cowboy. And cowboys are different. It was the cowboy life on a cowboy budget that ultimately honed Jerry's knack for craftsmanship into an art form and launched his career as a master spur maker. Somebody couldn't afford them. They were $25 a piece for a pair of spurs then. And, uh, but he started making things and just mounting them when he was on the ranch because he needed the equipment and he couldn't afford to buy it. Repairing his own spurs on the ranch led to a high demand to do the same for other working cowboys. And before he knew it, Jerry was turning metal scraps into usable tools and he couldn't make them fast enough. And the more and more and more the cowboys that started using this stuff, then more of them wanted it. And the next thing you know, there was a waiting list to get them. And they were good spurs, and everybody wanted a good pair of spurs. His number one priority was the cowboy and the user. That's how he gained his reputation. Jury always said this, to judge how well a spur is, you need to just have the spur there, no decoration, just ironwork and then you would know how well it's made. He made a real clean spur. His silver work was very precise. His engraving was very precise. He had good smooth steel work. He had creativity. But to, at the basis of all this is of people like Jerry Cates. And that, and that was a big addition. That was a big plus to Jerry Cates spurs is that people like Jerry Cates. That $25 pair of spurs Jerry couldn't afford as a working cowboy are a far cry from the works of art being sold at auctions today. Jerry Kate's spurs attract cowboys and collectors alike and sell for thousands. And he didn't like that. What he started Jerry's business was cowboys. And he still had that mentality of he was gonna make them for the cowboys. And the cowboys couldn't afford that. Nevertheless, she says he would have been proud although not as proud as he was of his family. Children Fritzy, Heath, and Yancey will attest to that. Jerry Cates was a dad, a husband, a cowboy, and a spur maker who lived the kind of life a man could hang his hat on. I guess we all miss him, but that goes with it, you know. Uh, we have all this that we have left of him, and that's good, and it will last a long time. So hats off to my good friend Jerry, a sure enough cowboy who now joins the ranks in Chester A. Reynolds Award history. It's inevitable that at some time all of us will complete that big circle. Jerry trotted a whole lot faster than we wanted him to. But I will always know that Jerry Cates is a part of my life as I strap those spurs on a pair of boots and know that they are superb craftsmanship and extremely well balanced and feel good on my heel. Jerry will be with me for the rest of my life. And here to accept the Chester A. Reynolds Memorial Award for Jerry Cates is a dear friend of his family, Matt Davis, along with the lady that kept him in line for a long, long time, Perky Cates.
never been up for these lights like this. <laughs> Jerry Case was a friend of mine. I met him in 1984. <laughs> in uh, Austin, Austin, Texas. This may not take over an hour. <laughs> And he told me not long after that, and we visited a lot, we've been, we were close, close friends for years. And he told me that he always wanted to make everything he made for the working cowboy. And when he accepted, or when they called him and told him he got this award, he called me. And he said, uh, uh, he was, how in the world? He said, I've never been as humbled by anything in my life. He said, how in the world did a cowboy or a cowpuncher from Ford County, Texas, by the way of Amarillo, get to the Cowboy Hall of Fame? And all I can say is because you're supposed to have been there. So on behalf of the Cage family, friends and all the people here, the board of directors, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking a real good man, a real good cowboy, and an artist from Ford County, Texas, by the way, Amarillo, to Oklahoma City at the Cowboy Hall of Fame. Thank you. The 2012 Harris Poll of America's top 10 favorite actors is out. And again this year, John Wayne has made the list, as he's done every year since they started taking the poll back in 1994. He's the only non-living actor ever to be chosen, which gives you a good idea of his unparalleled place in American culture. To present our first group of Literary Wrangler Awards representing the Wayne family, our granddaughter, Anita LaCava Swift and grandson, Brendan Wayne, an actor with credits including cowboy sci-fi blockbuster, Cowboys and Aliens, <laughs> and a remake of the John Wayne classic, Angel and the Bad Man. Would you please welcome Anita LaCava Swift and Brendan Wayne. Okay, I stopped Danny from crying after that horrible clap for Cowboys and Aliens, guys. <laughs> but I'm happy to bring another relative of mine uh, to the museum to enjoy. Um, it was something special for my grandfather to have this museum be built. So I love to pass it on to the rest of the family. I'm honored to be here and I thank you all for uh, supporting this. It was something that was important to my grandfather and, and because of that, those values that the Western heritage instills in us, I'm able to instill in my children, so thank you. This museum meant a lot to the man we called Granddaddy, and we're so proud to be part of these awards again this year. Most of us in the family never get tired of hearing from the fans who still like to talk about him. I assume that you're referring to my reference. I was being interviewed for something, and they asked me about John Wayne, and with a serious tone, I told him, hey, I don't want to talk about it. We weren't on good terms. And the interviewer got of all serious. Of course, Danny was only 10 at the time. <laughs> well, he got all serious. I'm so sorry. I said, no, seriously, though, I, I, I'm still amazed by his performances, the fact that they transcend generations. And, and for what people mostly consider a male audience, I have three daughters, and they all love him. And uh, I, I am truly proud to be his grandson and part of this museum uh, through him. Brendan, let's present some awards. This year's outstanding juvenile book is Milagro of the Spanish Bean Pot, written by Emerita Romero Anderson and illustrated by Randall Pijuan. Published by Texas Tech University Press and sponsored by Ellen Vick. This story is based in 1790 in a tiny Spanish colonial village in the kingdom of New Mexico, where po pottery is as crucial to the starving villagers as the rains that might save their scorched bean fields. 
When his widowed mother's only pot cracks, 11-year-old Ramundo knows his family's last hope lies with Clay Woman, quite possibly a powerful witch. In addition to drought and famine, Ramundo faces the return of Comanche raiders and his mother's failing health as he risks all to learn Clay Woman's secrets. Even as he prays for a miracle, he knows he must summon the courage to save his family and his people. Sadly, the author, Emerita Romero Anderson, passed away two weeks ago after a two-year brave battle with cancer. Here to accept her Wrangler Award for Outstanding Juvenile Book are her daughter and son-in-law, Megan and Brad Githens, along with illustrator Randy Pijuan. Well, as you can imagine, um, uh, the speech that I had written or had thought I was going to say a month ago uh, is very different than the words I'm going to share with you tonight uh, because of the passing of Emerita. Um, and so you have to kind of deal with this, uh, <laughs> it's fraught with many emotions. Um, Emerita is an incredibly gifted and talented author, and this book was one of, of a trilogy. It was the first book, and um, The Adventures of Ramundo uh, in this time period that was mentioned. Um, so it's still not finished for us, and, and this is just amazing that the first book is being honored by all of you and this board and the National Western Heritage Museum, and I feel very honored to be up here with her daughter who is just as beautiful as Emerita, both in spirit and in person. Um, it's strange, I was just talking to Emerita four weeks ago, and to be talking about her legacy now, um, she's still so alive. She's, she's still so alive, uh, especially with her beautiful daughter here. Um, but she has a legacy in this book that's being honored by this incredible room of artists and cowboys and people that believe in this Western heritage. And I grew up in northern New Mexico. Uh, I was born in Santa Fe. My grandfather owned trading posts throughout the upper Rio Grande area so that people could afford health care. He was a doctor and they could trade blankets and pottery and, and uh, jewelry for his uh, services. and. Uh, and there's not a lot of books that really cover the subject of the Hispano Mestizo culture in the upper Rio Grande. And Emerita uh, Romero Anderson um, had such a textured genius when she would write about uh, this culture and all the colors. And, uh, and this is the point where I have to thank um, Texas Tech University Press for believing in this project for uh, taking a black and white idea and turning it into this beautiful colored book that uh, will sit on the shelf next to some of the greatest books I have of, um, of, of the ages, especially uh, with this Hispano culture uh, being represented by her mother so well in this uh, incredible book. Um, so I'm, I apologize, I've abandoned my speech because I, um, I'm going to give it over to her beautiful daughter here. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for helping my mom's dreams come true. Our next Wrangler Award category is for Outstanding Nonfiction Book, sponsored by Ken and Jimmy Davidson. After Cusser, Loss and Transformation in Sioux Country is by Paul Hedren and published by the University of Oklahoma Press. In this unique contribution to American Western history, the author begins where many histories end, after the shooting stops. 
It examines the comprehensive effect that the end of the Great Sioux War had on the Northern Great Plains and its inhabitants. Paul documents the domino effect created by the war's end, including the spread of the railroads, the flood of hide hunters who decimated buffalo herds, and the introduction of cattlemen, all of which created a new Western culture. The book includes personal testimonies of individuals who witnessed history, including the burial of Custer, lending vibrancy to the story of change in Sioux country. Accepting the award for Outstanding Nonfiction Book Author, Paul Hedren, and Editor-in-Chief at the University of Oklahoma Press, Chuck Rankin. Well, this was a fun project. Um, I've written a lot of Indian Wars history, and, uh, and, and, and that spawns the interest. But as you heard, this is a book about so much more. This is a book about the consequences of war. Um, it was a long time coming. I remember sending uh, Chuck, um, Chuck Rankin, a friend, uh, some chapters of this thing uh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. But then a lot happened. Um, I had a demanding job with the National Park Service then that that didn't allow a great deal of time for avocational writing, which this was then. Um, and then I remarried, and then I retired, um, and then I relocated across the state of Nebraska, and then I actually got interested in an entirely different book project, which I, I saw through from start to finish. And, and all the while, my friend here is just, well, he wasn't so great. Uh, but, we got her, but we got her to the end. I want to thank Chuck Rankin and to the University of Oklahoma Press. I, I sent chapters to him because I wanted a friend's reaction and, and I wanted very much to work with the University of Oklahoma Press. Um, they're just a fine body of people and please extend my regards to, to your colleagues. I want to acknowledge my wife Connie. Um, she comes lately to this obsession of mine with history and uh, she learned early on in this marriage that when I'm in my study and and uh, I'm just into it to, to just leave me alone. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not much of a husband, I'm afraid. But she's a great traveler, and she's a great photographer. And, and in the springtime, when I, when I start to express my wants to travel, you know, to the Black Hills again or to some remote corner of Montana, you know, she just she, she smiles, and there we go. Um, of course, she'd rather go, I think, to the Colorado Rockies or to some White Sands beach, and I, I owe those uh, to her someday. Well, I want to thank the museum. Um, I want to thank the referees in this category. I've looked at the recipients of the books in this category uh, before me, and, and these are f historians and writers who have written some very important work, and that you invite me to stand with them um, humbles me deeply. Uh, thank you all very much. Indeed, I think this is the third book that Paul and I have done together over the course of the last uh, going on 25 years. And uh, this one uh, makes me as proud or prouder of any of them that we've done. I do remember driving across uh, uh, North Dakota, as I recall, on a, my way to a fur trade symposium 12 years ago when we uh, discussed this book seriously. And I hope this can be uh, a, an indication to all uh, the good authors that are sitting out there tonight that uh, as University of Oklahoma Press, we can be very patient. <laughs> thanks to the museum. Uh, thanks to Chuck Schroeder. Thank you to the judges. We appreciate this war award very, very much. There are lots of ways to end up loving the Western lifestyle. We were pretty much born into it. But Patricia Frolander married into it, wrote poems about it, and won a Wrangler Award for it in the category of Outstanding Poetry Book, sponsored by Harrison Orr. Published by High Plains Press, Married Into It provides a vivid and honest portrayal of ranch life. 
In poems that speak of relationships, family, natural beauty, and hard work, the writer evokes the true Western spirit and love for the ranching life. She celebrates the freedom and challenges of the ranching profession from the distinct viewpoint of a wife, mother, and grandmother. Born and raised in the city, the author faced a hard transition moving to her husband's ranch in Wyoming. But the poems she once wrote to get through hard times now provide a window into the lifestyle she has come to love and partnerships she and her husband cherish. This book makes clear why Patricia Frolander was recently named Wyoming's Poet Laureate. Accepting the award for Outstanding Poetry Book are Patricia Frolander and her publisher, Nancy Curtis, owner of High Plains Press. Thank you, Oklahoma, for such a warm welcome. I'm just so honored to be here. I can't hardly stand it. Um, thank you. You know, my husband brought me to the ranch when I was 25 and taught me everything I know, which, is from my perspective, was quite substantial.